All right. Um, well, next up, we have Dr. Sethivian Yu, co-founder and chief scientist of Helicity Space. They will be talking about Fusion Powered Helicity Drive. So thank you very much to all the organizers, to Dr. Zubrin, for inviting me to um, represent a large team, um, reasonably large team involving academia, us, the private company, and uh, national labs to be able to talk about this new fusion propulsion concept. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the support of the Limitless Space Institute um, and the Department of Energy for uh, some of the work behind um, this concept. Um, and also acknowledge the private investors behind the company who are among the first to believe in, in, in the idea. So <clears throat> the outline of the talk really is um, trying to answer three basic questions really. Um, you know, can we have fast and fuel efficient space propulsion? Um, address the elephant in the room, will fusion work? And then question three is really going into the details as to um, what is this new uh, fusion propulsion concept and why, why it's different from the others. So, you know, how fast do we want to go? You know, to between Earth and Mars, the distances are typically in the hundreds of millions of kilometers, um, depending on their relative positions in the orbit around the sun. Um, you have to go up this gravitational hill, um, you know, and, and try to get there as fast as possible. So you need a lot of energy to get there. Um, and if you want to fly fast, you need a lot of power um, and the typical velocities. And these numbers are really order of magnitude. It's really just to give an idea. Um, you know, you need hundreds of thousands of kilometers per hour, you know, kilometers per second delta Vs. Um, the, the kind of objects that we've launched into space and the fastest objects you know, are, are uh, listed on the left roughly to give you an order of magnitude idea as to how fast objects can go in space. Um, they're, they're very fast by our day-to-day uh, -day, uh, purposes. Um, and some of them, some of those velocities can approach, um, uh, you know, fast bars, interplanetary tra uh, uh, transportation. The, the question next is really how fuel efficient can it be? Now, I'd like to focus on, you know, the big payloads, um, things like um, uh, human class uh, type uh, payloads. Um, and, you know, typically, for example, you would launch people with all the support structure around it to, to provide life. Um, and it'd be tens of tons per person um, that you need to be able to send um, at these really, really high velocities. So with existing um, um, propellant and existing rockets, um, you could you would need a lot of propellant mass, chemical propellant mass, um, to be able to launch um, and then accelerate um, these payloads to extremely high velocities. And although it's a lot of mass, of propellant mass, um, you need you can only burn it all for a few minutes, and then after that you have to coast. Um, to be able to go faster, you need to carry even more propellant, so you get that rocket uh, equation um, hurdle where you just get an exponential growth of propellant mass as required and becomes quickly unfeasible. Now, to reach high speeds, of course, we all know that we need a lot of thrust power um, per unit mass, so the specific thrust. And these engines, you know, the SpaceX Raptor, the, the Saturn V F1 rockets have very high power. You know, if you add it to all the, all the systems, the Starships, the Space Shuttle, and so on, um, you know, it's still reasonably high enough power that um, you know, you can, you can go reasonably fast. Now, all these engines use chemical energy. Um, so you would take this propellant, burn it out, and use chemical energy to exhaust the propellant out the back to push your rocket forward. If you want fuel efficiency, though, um, you want a very high velocity, exhaust velocity of this propellant. So the higher, the better. Um, the maximum velo exhaust velocity is effectively limited by the amount of chemical energy you can carry. Um, you know, in this case, you can express it as a maximum temperature, which is of the order of a thousand K and so on. So how do you go faster? How would you exhaust this faster to be more fuel efficient? Well, one option is to add a uranium, you know, core, solid core to be able to increase the propellant temperature to, you know, a few thousand degrees in a factor of three or so, a factor of two or three. So um, nuclear thermal propulsion, you know, works and um, some one has flown and others um, are in the planning stages and would increase the fuel efficiency, which means that for the same amount of propellant, you could go faster or you would go to the same speeds with less propellant. So that's pretty good. Another option um, is to take electricity, um, put some kind of electrical power source on board, and then you accelerate the plasma propellant. 
Um, and the idea is basically you use electricity and magnetic fields, and electrostatic fields and electromagnetic fields to accelerate a cold plasma um, as fast as possible. And the advantage is you can really, really good, um, have high exhaust velocity. So for example, the ion thrusters, you know, would have um, a much larger exhaust velocity. And if you add it to, you know, to solar panels and then you, you, you send it to Mercury, you have the Bepi Colombo uh, mission. Um, you can also plan to do this with um, small nuclear fission um, power plants, similar to nuclear submarines, like the GMO mission um, plan with 200 kilowatt electric nuclear reactor to, to the Jupiter icy moons. Um, Vasimir, you could put the 200 or 100 kilowatt electric. The, the, the hurdle is that um, these nuclear um, uh, reactors are very, very heavy. The thrust or the, the electrical power per unit mass is not super attractive. You have to add radiators and so on. Um, so the actual thrust, specific thrust is still reasonably low. However, it's very fuel efficient. So another option is just to take the electricity on board and instead of accelerating the plasma, you want to heat the plasma. You heat the plasma now to 100 million degrees. Um, at that kind of temperature, anything above 10 million degrees, um, you start to get fusion reactions. Um, that releases 10 million times more energy than chemical energy, so you can do something um, interesting with that and really accelerate the plasma out the back um, at very, very high velocities. So, you know, there's been lots of uh, studies on, on magnetic fusion, on fusion, um, different fusion concepts, and I've given two examples here, um, one based on the spherical tokamak, where you would have 8 gigawatts of uh, thrust, and then spheromax, you know, with you know, about 3 gigawatts of thrust. And they start to become very attractive because they have very large specific thrust at very large specific impulse. You can really start going fast. Our concept kind of fits within um, the same kind of scales um, um, in terms of thrust um, and specific impulse. One of the major advantages, and we'll go into that, is that we can actually dial down the power levels to something that is a little bit more near term, somewhat comparable to um, uh, electric propulsion. And then if we deliver that, then scale up uh, eventually up to the large, fully self-sustained, fantastic drives that, that we all want. So to put some numbers on this, this is the, the, the final plot with, with the numbers where um, you can see the main, the main important part of the numbers is um, to go really fast to go to Mars in a month or so um, with a very large human class payloads, you want thrust powers of order of kilowatt thrust per kilogram. Anything above that is really nice. But then if you want reasonable fuel mass ratios, um, you want very high specific impulse. So the ideal um, interplanetary um, uh, colonization, uh, reusable rapid transportation system would sit on the top right here. Um, another interesting um, uh, line that you could uh, look at is the thrust to weight ratio. Many people ask, can fusion be used for launch? Well, not really, because you want a thrust to weight ratio that is larger than one. So chemical propulsion is still the best way to launch a system. However, um, in space, um, you know, these, these um, uh, concepts would be a, a great solution. The numbers over here are basically to show the scalability of our concepts um, to go from something that is of the order of close to what exists um, in the near term to something that's um, scalable all the way up to the fully self-sustained um, power plants flying in space. So we need fusion. The question, of course, that everyone always asks is, will fusion work? So I have to give a quick overview as to how fusion uh, works. So this, the conventional way of doing it is um, to hold the plasma in a steady state with magnetic fields at a given density. Um, and typically, you're limited by the strength of the magnetic field, so you're typically at the low densities. And then because it's steady state, um, you want to have steady state heating and slowly raise the temperature or rapidly raise the temperature to those 100 million degrees. So you're competing with the heat loss, the energy confinement time, the thermal insulation um, to be able to raise the temperature. It's a bit like boiling coffee. Um, you, know, you, you want to put some heat in, but you have to compete with the heat loss. So a better thermal insulation means you have um, um, an easier time of raising the temperature. Now with magnetic confinement fusion, because you're limited at low densities, the only way to really increase the confinement time is to increase the size of the machine. So all these data points are all the experiments around the world over the last 70 years, or most of them anyway, um, and slowly and diligently moving up towards the black line, which is the Lawson criterion, which tells you when 
um, you're getting more energy out than what you put in um, in terms of heating. So the progress has been slow but steady, um, and we're getting very very close to the to the to the well, not the finish line but the beginning of the finish line. Um, and then these two um, experiments, these are um, Salva Plant Spark over in um, um, Boston, um, is going to um, try and cross that line. The convention, the second conventional way of doing this is um, to use lasers and to ignore trying to increase the confinement time. What you do is you just hold a solid pellet, so at solid densities, hold a solid pellet of um, fuel, and then you use some radiation, so lasers converted to X-rays in a very, very short pulse, short enough to be able to compress the fuel pellet to uh, fusion temperatures um, before it disassembles itself. So you use its own inertia in doing that. Um, so that, that works. Um, there's been some fantastic results um, from the National Ignition Facility over in Livermore um, in California, where, um, you, depending on how you, you quantify it, but you've basically effectively shown that you can cross this uh, loss and criterion threshold and get more energy out than what you put in. Um, so, you know, the, the, the scientific proof or principle of fusion, getting more energy out than put in, is feasible. Now, because you rely on the inertia, the only way to really go further is to increase the power and therefore the size of lasers to be able to compress these tiny little millimeter sized pellets with lasers the size of football field. Um, and you need to go in, on increasing to be able to increase the, the fusion gain. So there's a third way, an intermediate way, um, which is like a Goldilocks alternative if you want, um, variously called magneto inertial fusion, magnetized target fusion, magnetized liner uh, inertial fusion. And those are um, more recent concepts and sometimes revisiting old concepts that were discarded but were rendered feasible with new discoveries and new technologies. Um, so one of them is basically to increase, um, add magnetic fields. So these don't have magnetic fields, but add magnetic fields to improve the thermal insulation um, and then do continue compressing. Um, or use the magnetic confinement, but even though the energy confinement time is not very good, instead of increasing the size of the machine, you just uh, compress it instead. And then the idea is compared to magnetic confinement fusion, um, you have a smaller power plant normally, um, and compared to the inertial confinement fusion, you have reduced drivers. So this Goldilocks zone um, is eminently suitable, in our opinion, to uh, space propulsion and power. So our concept, um, our first data point, if you want, um, from uh, a precursor experiment is around there. And the idea is of our development path is to move towards uh, that uh, uh, line. Now, you can also plot the cost, overall cost of um, the expected cost of the, uh, of the system um, as a function of its density. So at low densities, you can see that magnetic confinement fusion is um, quite expensive. And then at the high density range, the compression drivers drive the cost um, of the fusion concept. While at the intermediate level, um, because of reduced size and reduced drive of power, there's a minimum um, in, the, in the cost curve, which gives an optimum range. We are about there in terms of density. Um, the, the, the heuristic way of understanding this is that the uh, rise of the cost to the left is due to the size of the machine and the size of the magnets. Um, and to the right, it's the cost of the lasers and the size of the lasers to be able to increase the density. And this one's to increase the confinement. So in terms of fusion propulsion concepts, there's been many. Um, and this plot here shows effectively that thrust power, which is that number above one where we want to be able to go really fast uh, around the solar system, again, as a function of its density. So on the left, you have the steady state magnetic fusion. And then on the right, you would have the pulse uh, laser fusion. And then in the middle, you would start to have the magnetized target fusion or the magnetic fusion and the intermediate densities. And the diameters of the circles represent roughly the total mass of the fusion concept. Um, just to give you a relative idea as to how big and heavy these, these systems are expected to be. So you can see that on the left, the magnetic fusion ones, like the uh, spherical tokamak um, uh, fusion mission to Jupiter, um, has you know hundreds of tons of, of mass. The inertial confinement fusion, like the Daedalus uh, project, which um, is 
mainly for an anti-cell emission um, is, is um, very massive. It's thousands of times and not tens of thousands of times. And um, the intermediate ones have potentially smaller and lower masses, which um, would be quite attractive. The other number that is interesting to look at is that these pulse concepts um, rely on a certain repetition rate to be able to have the power required for, um, for pushing large payload around the solar system. Um, the assumption for many of these pulse concepts are um, quite high repetition rates, hundreds of hertz or 30 hertz, um, tens of hertz at least to be able to uh, compress um, these plasmas either with lasers or um, some kind of liner. Our concepts in general um, are try to approach it with a more modest um, repetition rate. So one hertz is, is, a, is a reasonable balance um, between feasibility and at the lowest level, actually um, much lower pulse rates, um, which is actually limited by the uh, auxiliary on board pulse supply. But in general, the idea is um, the masses um, are um, significantly smaller than, than the other concepts. So um, what is our concept? Um, if there's only one slide that you want to remember, um, it's probably this one. This one is, is what summarizes everything. It's, it's a pulse magnetic neutral fusion system designed for space propulsion um, and then at the larger scale for power and exploits three key ideas. Um, so these are based on experimental observations and laboratory. We, we've made all these um, uh, discoveries in the laboratory recently and we're putting it all together. So something called magnetic plexus to be able to confine the plasma. Um, magnetic reconnection heating to preheat the plasma after formation. Um, and then we use peristaltic compression um, to be able to raise the energy density. Um, combining all three together um, results in quite a, a new scalable performance that has, doesn't exist, uh, that has not existed before. The fusion triple products, so the, the performance in terms of how long you can hold the plasma and raise the temperature to fusion condition has a new factor inside it, which is proportional to the number of plasma sources um, raised to some power. And that means that the number of plasma guns and the number of plasma sources, there is a new control node for us as operators, in addition to all the other fusion concepts that would use, for example, the plasma current, the magnetic field strength, the plasma size, or the compression ratio. Um, it means that with this new factor, we can can compensate somewhat for uncertainties in the confinement time. If the confinement is a bit lower, we can just increase you know, the number of guns instead. Um, the other advantage is that to increase the power levels, you can spread the input energy required to generate fusion over a larger number of guns, um, which reduces the engineering requirements uh, of each gun. Um, the other thing is the development path is now can be quite rapid because it's like um, cylinders in a car engine. Um, you can test the idea very, very early on at modest cost and then ramp up very quickly because you just have to add more cylinders if you want to the, to the engine uh, rather than increasing the size of a single cylinder. Um, so the physics basis, um, what are these magnetic plectronemes? Um, the Mochi experiment that we built before um, as a precursor experiment has observed these very, very long-lived stable uh, plasma jets in the laboratory generated from one of these plasma guns. Um, it's about a meter long and it lasts um, you know, tens to 100 microseconds, um, which is extremely stable. It's 100 times the instability time scale. Um, and one thing that was um, exciting was that the magnetic field inside these jets was double helical, what we call plectinemic. It's uh, like a double helix DNA strand um, that, if you want to have an intuitive picture, is a bit like a rubber band torus that is stretched, twisted, and stuffed into a, a cylinder, which is the plasma jet in this case. Um, our colleague at the Swarthmore um, um, uh, College has an experiment that where they discovered this first inside, not a jet um, close to um, in vacuum, but in a jet um, inside a closed cylinder with close fitting walls. Um, and they discovered the same, the same uh, structure. So these plectinemes um, are very have very interesting properties. They have helical shear flows. They're stable, um, and they can be manipulated under very long aspect ratio. And they're more stable than torsion. The second physics uh, basis is reconnection heating. If we merge multiple magnetic objects, the magnetic field lines can merge together and reconnect, and then some of the dissipated magnetic energy um, heats up the plasma. 
This was demonstrated around the world over decades um, using toruses, um, various types of toruses, um, and then recently with uh, these plectinine double helical fields merged together in the center. And this plot shows basically the strength of the magnetic field and then the temperature that you would get out of it. And you can start getting fusion temperatures, which is above a thousand here, um, you know, reasonably with modest uh, magnetic field, at least at low densities. And what we aim to do is to try and do this uh, at high density. The third um, uh, operation that we have is um, the magnetic compression. This is a, a, was invented by our colleague at uh, Caltech, um, who basically aligned, put set a series of coils in a transmission line setup um, that is tapered. And then you send a double current pulse through it. And effectively, you have a traveling magnetic field that will start to increase in field and slow down. So the front of the field slows down, and the rear of the field comes in and piles up. So if you trap the plasma in the center here, it will start in the frame of the plasma. It looks like an enclosure in the compression. So the advantage of combining all that is that the compression ratio needed to reach fusion conditions um, because of the preheating doesn't need to be as high as if you did it purely by compression. Um, so these are the steps of how it works. Um, you, know, you form a, a, any number of pectinemic jets uh, at the beginning into that front uh, magnetic field. As it travels, the reconnection uh, preheats the plasma and especially the ions, um, which is compared to other standard heating methods, um, or made steady state, um, neutral beams, charged particles, um, and so on, um, radio frequency is internal, it's very high power efficient and directly heats the ions um, and not the electrons. So then you can start raising this non isothermal plasma to the thermonuclear regime over slightly longer time scales than the electron confinement time. And as it travels down the nozzle to the throat, it reaches peak condition. Um, um, and then as the fusion uh, reactions heat the plasma further, you can mix it with cooler propellant to augment the thrust and adjust the ISP. We've done preliminary numerical simulations. These are the very preliminary pictures with Los Alamos um, to help us inform the design and timing of, all, of a loss of system. And the key idea really is, and that's different from prior fusion concepts, is that uh, the fusion output uh, scales with a number of plasma grams, so you can see the plasma sources there. Um, that means we have three different classes of engine, um, what we call small, medium, and large. And the small one is really the simplest possible idea. You just take some kind of power source, um, you create the fusion conditions, and then you, you eject it out the back with some kind of small gain. Right? It doesn't have to be huge gain because you don't need to make electricity. So if you take a 100 kilowatt electric, you would get 50 kilowatt thrust, for example. That's at this level with X number of grams. That's what we call an fusion afterburner. It, the performance might not be spectacular, but um, at least it'd be a fusion propulsion system in place. If you increase the number of guns such that the fusion power increases, you can add some power conversion system that adds extra mass, but this will contribute to the input power. And therefore, you can start raising for a given 100 kilowatt electric, start raising the thrust output until you get more thrust out than you put in, uh, effectively thanks to um, the recirculation of energy. And then, of course, if the recirculation is such that it covers all the required input energy, that's a fully self sustained fusion drive. Um, and yeah, the sky is, is a limit, but there's an upper limit in terms of time. But this scalability idea means that um, you can start early um, and there's no need to wait for the full fusion drive. Um, so these slides um, are a little bit detailed, but really the, it's a bit like going doing a shopping list when you buy buy an engine or buy a car. On the left are the specifications, the detailed technical specification. On the right is roughly what the missions could do potentially. Um, and the idea of the smallest scale um, is that we get not very high specific thrust, but it's reasonably uh, low weight. It can be launched in the Falcon 9 rocket. Um, if we have a 100 kilowatt electric power source, we would get tens of kilowatt thrust. And the idea is this development pass is what we're focusing on, um, is to really start demonstrating this and then do the minimum viable uh, prototype in, in space um, uh, as soon as possible. Um, these are some of the um, mission level figures in there. Um, now, if you go up much larger into like 20, 20 guns, 29 guns and so on, you can start um, um, getting quite a lot of thrust and power. And then we're thinking of studying missions, for example, in Cisluna as a heavy freight cycle, just to be able to show how fuel efficiency, even though it won't be fast to be able to take a cargo between the Earth and the Moon, 
um, but if you can do it over um, um, multiple multiple um, cycles, you could reduce the cost from uh, reusability in principle. And then, of course, what we're most interested in eventually in the long run would be the large and extra large scales uh, where it's fully self-sustained. You don't even need any auxiliary power and you get megawatts of thrust and gigawatts of thrust at these large specific powers that um, open up the uh, solar system um, to um, interplanetary transport, for example, a reusable cycle between Earth and Mars, uh, for example, for 150 tons to, to Mars rendezvous, um, you could do it in a few months um, with the L scale and the extra large scale, which is a peak one. You could go really, really quickly. Um, we're working on studies on um, future missions, um, like planetary defense, since that object rendezvous, um, and, and so on. Um, so the stage of the company right now, we're at the early days, um, we're building on our, our um, new experiments to uh, uh, prove all this, to demonstrate all this. Hardware has been cut. You've seen the magnetic nozzle um, uh, that, that's already been cut. So a lot of this is, is um, going to be built very soon, built um, um, from past experience. Um, so, you know, I hope that um, this presentation provided some beginnings of the answers to the, the three uh, questions that fusion propulsion could be a solution for fast and fuel efficient space propulsion. Um, the question will fusion work, you know, as scientists, the proof of principle has been demonstrated. Um, it becomes, a, a, there's still some science to do, but there's a lot of engineering issues that we have, everyone has to work through. Um, and then what is the holistic drive fusion concept? Um, it's one of the new compact fusion concepts that's, that's uniquely designed to be scalable and primarily for propulsion first before being a power system. So with that, thank you very much. And um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Yu. We have a lot of questions. And the first question is from Nicholas. And they say, how would the plasma source be replenished while the rocket was flying in space? Um, the plasma source are basically the fuel tanks. It's basically hydrogen, um, well, deuterium in this case, in our situation, we use deuterium fuel tanks. So, you know, the, the imagination is that we're going to have large um, liquid deuterium um, uh, tanks, and then they will just be injected um, into, into the plasma gun. Thank you. Next question. Is the exhaust toxic? <laughs> So the exhaust is mainly helium um, because the fusion reaction from deuterium generates um, um, mostly charged particles in the form of helium that the electron will be neutral. So that is not toxic. Um, however, um, there are, if you mean by toxic, there's, there's going to be neutrons as well that will come out. And the neutrons um, are extremely energetic and neutrons impacting materials or impacting the human body can um, um, have then detrimental effects. So there will have to be shielding, of course, um, to um, mitigate the neutron damage on materials and, and uh, systems and payloads and so on. Um, the fact that this is placed really far away from the payload, so this would be, for example, a human crew to, to Mars, um, is one of the reasons you want to be able to put the uh, radioactive system, mildly radioactive system, as far away as possible. Um, and then you would shadow this with a shielding system. Thanks for the answer. Next question is from Thomas. They say, Dr. Yu, which materials would be appropriate for such high fusion temperatures at the nozzle? Oh, so the nozzle, um, at these kind of temperatures, you, you use magnetic fields to thermally insulate the, these high, hot temp high temperatures from anything um, that's material. You really don't want to touch the walls. Um, with, with this hot plasma because it will just melt you know, everything. Um, and it will also cool the plasma, which we don't want. So, um, so the, the main material would be, um, at the moment, there's many ways of doing it, but um, we want uh, boron carbide uh, shielding, for example, um, uh, tungsten coated um, boron carbide as well. Um, and then there'll be blankets uh, to be able to thermalize, which was probably we're thinking about it, but probably the best option would be liquid water, actually, um, as a neutron um, a thermalizer and moderator. Great, thank you. Next question comes from Douglas, and they say, couldn't one use neutron-neutron fusion to get around the Coulomb barrier? Um, neutron-neutron fusion doesn't work. 
All right. Well, the next question is even, from Amit. Even the neutron star levels of, um, of um, densities. Got it. The so next question is from Amit. They say, are you revisiting the idea of heating plasma exhaust using X-ray laser while it is being ejected? Um, we don't use lasers or X-rays um, to heat the plasma. We're um, heating the plasma with magnetic fields. We believe it's much more efficient to do it that way than using lasers. Um, Next question. Are you considering Z-pinching the exhaust to reach fusion? Um, this is very close to a Z-pinch concept. It has an internal current that um, is very, very close to a Z-pinch. Um, you can think of it as a screw pinch. So a Z-pinch only has an axial current and uh, ours has an axial as well as an isomutal current. So that's why you have this double helix system. Um, but a lot of the physics is very, very similar. It's self-pinched, um, it's self-stable. Um, thanks to shear flows, but instead of just an actual shear flow, we have helical shear flows that stabilize the plasma well. So the external magnetic compression is to come in addition to the self-pinching. Thank you. We have two more minutes for questions. So um, I'll read one of the recent ones. How quickly and easily can this system be turned off in case of an emergency? Um, since it's a pulse system, it's very easy to turn it off. Um, in fact, most fusion systems, it's very easy to turn things off. It's very hard to start it. I think that's why fusion is taking so long to, to get there. If, if anything goes wrong, the whole thing just stops. All right. And the last question is from Dennis. Would it be possible to accelerate the plasma at the output with the magnetic field, like a railgun, instead of compressing it? Well, the acceleration um, with a railgun um, is not as efficient as converting the hot plasma exhaust as it, as it expands out in a diverging magnetic field, like a, like a standard nozzle effect. Um, so because the pressure from the high temperature plasma expanding out um, to the magnetic field coils of that diverging nozzle um, generates a large thrust. Accelerating with a, with a rail gun, you would need very, very long distances, and then the acceleration force will decrease with the length. So um, railguns are not extremely efficient. 